Um, Julia, ready to start whenever you are. Okay, thanks very much, Julie. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second in the Mind Gardens Tertiary Referral Service for Psychosis seminar series. My name is Julia Lappin. I'm the clinical director for the Tertiary Referral Service for Psychosis. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country and of lived experience. I acknowledge the strength and resilience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are the traditional custodians of the diverse countries from which we're joining this meeting. I'm privileged to be calling from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present today. I also acknowledge people with lived experience of mental ill health and recovery and the experience of people who have been carers, families or supporters. So a brief introduction to the Tertiary Referral Service for Psychosis, TRSP. We're a New South Wales health funded statewide service hosted by South East Sydney Local Health District. We're very grateful to South East Sydney Local Health District and New South Wales Health and to the Mind Gardens Neuroscience Network for their ongoing support of TRSP. The TRSP aims to improve lives of people living with complex psychosis. We do so through the delivery of our clinical service, which welcomes referrals from across the state of anyone living with psychosis who is cared for in New South Wales public mental health services. We also run education and training programs aimed at developing a community of practice for capacity building in complex psychosis care. And this webinar series is an example of that capacity building. The webinar series is supported by Mind Gardens Neuroscience Network. Mind Gardens is a partnership between its members, Neura, Black Dog Institute, UNSW Sydney, and the Southeastern Sydney Local Health District. Mind Gardens brings together clinicians, researchers, health service administrators, and people with lived experience to design research and quality improvement projects that match consumers' priorities and make a real difference in people's lives. The Mind Gardens TRSP webinar series will run throughout 2023 monthly. So please look out for emails from TRSP events, which will detail future webinars all tailored for clinicians. So some housekeeping. Uh, there are participants you can, in the audience. You can all write any questions or responses to questions asked during the webinar in the chat, and we will address those questions in the discussion at the end. There will be some polls throughout the webinar and a simple anonymous poll towards the end of the webinar Please do complete that as we use that feedback to understand how worthwhile the event was. We also appreciate your feedback by email, including topics you'd welcome at future webinars. This event is recorded and we will distribute a link to the event video within two weeks to all those who have provided an email address. You can opt out of communications at any time with a return email with unsubscribe in the subject line. And finally, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Matthew Large, who's our panellist and chair for uh, my talk today. Matthew is a conjoint professor at UNSW and chief psychiatrist at Eastern Suburbs Mental Health Service, part of South East Sydney Local Health District. Matthew has long-standing research interests in suicide, psychiatric aspects of homicide and substance misuse among people living with mental illness. Uh, over to you, Matthew. Um, and look, um, welcome to the Ides of March, everybody. Um, and uh, reciprocally, um, uh, I'd like to introduce Julia, who introduced herself a little, but um, Julia is a very man valued member of um, our service. Um, she's the clinical director of the uh, tertiary referral um, program for psychosis. Um, she's a clinician, she's a researcher, she's an associate professor at UNSW. Um, um, and at um, NDARC. Um, she has, uh, I think, well over 20 years of experience um, clinically um, in Australia and in the United Kingdom, um, and with the underlying theme of um, really improving the lives of people with psychotic disorders. 
Um, so over to you, Julia. Thanks, Matthew. So the title of today's talk is Drug-Related Psychosis, What to Ask and What to Do. This is an outline of the topics that I will try to cover today. Um, and it is important to remember that the slides are available. I'm going to move through them quite quickly. I'm really trying to introduce important concepts and, and ask people online to really think about some of the questions that we're dealing with. Because in my experience, the concept of drug-related psychosis can often be misunderstood and the term used loosely by clinicians. So we're going to start with a small poll, which Julie's going to share. Uh, if you'd all like to just take 10 seconds to answer the poll, the question is, which drug is most commonly involved in drug-related psychosis? And I'll just give you a minute to respond to that. OK, I think we've got most of the answers through now. And look, I'm really interested to see these responses because I think that reflects um, a really common uh, misapprehension in our community around how uh, powerful methamphetamine is in giving rise to drug-related psychosis. There's no doubt that meth methamphetamine does contribute to drug-related psychosis, uh, but in fact, the, most, the drug most commonly involved in drug-related psychosis is alcohol because it's used by so many more people, even though proportionally fewer people uh, who use alcohol develop psychosis. Overall, we have so many more people using alcohol that it's alcohol which is the drug most commonly involved. And uh, we will come to data that show this in due course. Okay, so um, I'll just move through to the next slide. And my slides have just stopped there, Julie, with the poll. There, we're back. Okay, so today I'm just going to spend a little bit of time initially talking about common illicit drugs. Uh, the most commonly used illicit drugs in Australia are cannabis, which is used by approximately 12% of the population. Uh, then methamphetamine and hallucinogens, which are both used only by about 1% of the population. And that compares to alcohol, which is used in risky manner by about a quarter of the population. Cannabis is derived from the cannabis sativa plant and forms that you will have heard of include marijuana and cannabis resin. <laughs> Cannabinoids is an overarching term which refers to any chemical which acts on the cannabinoid receptors in the brain. Tetrahydrocarbon, commonly known as THC, is the cannabinoid responsible for most of the psychoactive effects of cannabis. And importantly, just so that you're aware of use patterns, cannabis can be smoked or ingested, for example, hash cookies or um, baked and spice cakes. The effects of cannabis will be experienced by the user within seconds of smoking, and those effects will last for two to three hours. They include euphoria, relaxation, and appetite stimulation. Let's think about methamphetamine now. The active metabolite of methamphetamine is amphetamine. Methamphetamine is a synthetically produced product and has been produced in various forms, legally and illegally, since the 1950s. Almost all the illicit amphetamine that is used in Australia is as methamphetamine, about 95%. Most users are male, and the majority of users are in their 20s and 30s, and that is common for all illicit substance use. Most people who use illicit drugs in the general population are in their 20s and 30s. So, Crystal methamphetamine is something that we read about all too often in the papers, and which we often see in emergency department. People can become very distressed, agitated, and sometimes psychotic. What's different about crystal meth compared to meth 
Crystal meth is very highly potent. It's a crystalline form of methamphetamine. Uh, it's particularly harmful because of its high potency. It also has high dependence potential. It's high purity, gets to the brain quickly. The effects are felt rapidly. And those are the perfect ingredients for high dependency. It can be taken in a number of ways and its effects are euphoria, but also activation, anxiety, and delirium. And the final group of drugs that I want to talk about are the psychedelics. So they're much in the press at the moment due to the recent controversial TGA decision to uh, license them. We're not going to talk about that today, but I do just want to make you all a bit aware of what psychedelics are. The same umbrella term hallucinogens can be used really interchangeably with the term psychedelics. They include LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, ketamine, and PCP, also known as angel dust. Their effects last for about 12 hours, but typically onset within an hour. Uh, and they include, again, euphoria, altered level of consciousness, but also, as the name hallucinogens suggests, hallucinations and dissociation. Some are from natural plant products, others are synthetic. These are highly potent drugs with very powerful effects at very low doses. And that's where the term microdoxin comes in. Okay, so having introduced the three major uh, drug categories that we're gonna deal with today, I'm gonna talk about the, the key question that we um, have come together to think about today, which is drug-related psychosis. I'm going to use the term drug related rather than drug induced or substance induced. Really, they're used quite interchangeably. I prefer the term drug related because I think that the term drug induced suggests to uh, the user and to indeed individuals who we treat that the substance is responsible for the psychosis. And I hope that during the course of today's talk, we'll see that things aren't quite as clear cut as that. I think the term drug related, recognising that the substance may have triggered or unmasked psychotic symptoms is more appropriate. So what is drug related psychosis? Okay, probably if we asked 100 people in the audience, we'd all come up with slightly different definitions. But this is the um, DSM de de definition. So we should really be going with DSM or ICD. Signs and symptoms of psychosis in the context of drug use. Symptoms develop during or within a month of substance intoxication or withdrawal. Substance use is etiologically, causally related to the disturbance. And symptoms are not better accounted for by a psychotic disorder that is not substance induced. So what is the value of this term? drug-related psychosis. In my experience, clinically, many people have difficulty distinguishing, and it is difficult, between psychotic symptoms which occur as an effect of substance use and the unmasking or triggering of psychotic illness by substance use. So when we're thinking about psychotic symptoms, um, how do we uh, think further about that question. There is a lot of difficulty distinguishing between these ideologies, and therefore I think when we see them together, we need to really ask more questions of the individual who's presenting. Because comorbid substance use is very common in people who have mental health difficulties, and just because we see two things happening at the same time, comorbid substance use and psychosis, doesn't mean that they causally relate to each other. About 30% of people um, with severe mental illness have some form of comorbid substance use. From a research perspective, lots of studies have been done looking at what happens to people with drug-related psychosis. And importing, importantly, and I'll show you some evidence in a few slides, studies of long-term outcomes following up these people over time suggest that the concepts of drug-related psychosis and other forms of psychosis are not easily separated. And therefore, myself and others 
have argued that someone who presents with psychotic symptoms in the context of substance use who hasn't already got a diagnosis of psychotic illness should be considered as someone who is vulnerable to psychosis development. And that's important because not everybody who uses substances will have psychotic symptoms, though many will. However, very many, many fewer people will experience enduring psychotic symptoms after the period of intoxication with that substance has passed. Those people who do have persisting symptoms, even for days, are therefore showing that they have a brain that is vulnerable to the development of psychotic symptoms. And it's likely that they may experience those same psychotic symptoms through that vulnerability uh, subsequently, perhaps in the context of substance use, perhaps not. And that's really our, our uh, important decision making that we need to make as clinicians about what is this person's future vulnerability to psychotic illness. So uh, myself and colleagues um, at NDARC and also Grant Sara at Inform have um, put together, um, we've written about this and this is one such editorial. We've argued that because it's evidence of vulnerability to psychosis, really um, when we see uh, drug related psychosis, we should see this as an opportunity for assertive intervention and prevention. So let's move on to the second point around drug related psychosis. What's the value? Does it tell us anything long term? Let's have a look. So um, Matthew, myself and again Grant Sara and one of his uh, medical students worked on a project that I'm going to describe to you now. Um, so the, con the context of Sorry, just before I do that, Julie has just um, uh, put up a second poll. So I'll, I'll keep talking in the background. But the context for why we looked at the question of how many people who have drug-related psychosis at first onset of psychosis 10 years later actually have a chronic enduring psychotic illness such as schizophrenia. That's a very important question for clinicians to know. We should know that figure in our head so that when we see someone with drug related psychosis, we know roughly what their risk for future development of schizophrenia is. And that's why we've included this poll here. So look again, we've got quite a mixed bag of responses. I can see that some people, um, about half the audience uh, believe that it would be, in fact, more than half the audience believe that it would be less than 15%. And that's really important to understand because actually the odds are much higher than that. Um, and I'll just come to talk about that now. So we'll just end that poll, but thanks very much for uh, participating. Just trying to move to the next slide. Julie, aha, uh -huh, that's great. So this is the um, paper that we worked on together. And what we did here was we conducted a meta-analysis. We got together all the research papers that have been conducted, looking at the question, what happens to drug-related psychosis 10 years later? But also what happens to other forms of psychosis 10 years later? What proportion of those different diagnoses over time convert to schizophrenia. And this is really around a well-recognized phenomenon of what we call diagnostic instability at time of first episode. And that's why a lot of first episode teams will use umbrella terms like psychotic illness, because we know that it takes some years for the true nature of the illness to really reveal itself. For some people, it's bipolar. For some people, it's schizophrenia. Here we looked at how many people with different diagnoses, including drug-related psychosis, made a transition to full schizophrenia over 10 years. And you can see here that substance-induced or substance-related psychosis resulted in a diagnosis of schizophrenia within 10 years for a quarter of people. So it's really quite high. This is a really important issue in mental health services because Drug-related psychosis, people who come in with psychotic symptoms and they're also using drugs, often it's regarded as a benign and transient 
effect of substance use. But we see from these data that that's not the case. About one in four of those individuals will develop schizophrenia, an enduring psychotic illness. The next question we asked when looking at these data was, does it matter which substance it is? Are you more likely to get schizophrenia if you have methamphetamine related psychosis or less likely? Who knows? Well, we know now, and this is what this question on this graph shows. It does matter which substance you use. So as you can see, cannabis is the highest transition rate. So people who present with cannabis related psychosis are um, the most likely to go on to develop schizophrenia. And that happens in about two and five of those individuals. People who present with alcohol related psychosis are only about one in 10 likely to go on to develop schizophrenia. But as we talked about previously, because so many more people use alcohol, actually that's the, the biggest total number of substance related psychosis would be alcohol related. You can see that amphetamines and hallucinogens, which are the other important drug groups we're gonna talk about today, roughly one in five or one in four of those people uh, are going to get schizophrenia. So transition rate to schizophrenia depends on the substance used. Uh, we also looked at other factors that might increase the rate of transition to schizophrenia. And we found that um, familial risk and genetic predisposition play a key role in the development of cannabis related psychosis and later transition to schizophrenia. And that is consistent with literature um, internationally that cannabis use doubles the risk of developing schizophrenia in vulnerable people. Rates of transition are higher among young people. And again, there's two reasons for that. One is the sheer numbers of people using illicit drugs in the general population. They're mostly in their 20s and 30s and in late teens. So it's young people who are using these drugs. Also, there's a, a high prevalence of people presenting with psychosis, particularly males in the teens and 20s. Psychosis can develop at any age, but if you're using drugs that may trigger it, perhaps that's why we're getting so many drug-related psychoses, drug-related psychoses in young people. So this is just a, uh, finally a schematic of the uh, data that I've summarized for you. And just to orientate you, we've got time along the, the bottom axis, the x-axis. Um, this study was conducted from a really large database of administrative data in Finland, and it really uh, is, is highly aligned with our findings that around 40% of people with um, using cannabis as a, their substance uh, early on will convert to schizophrenia within eight years. And then as we see, still high risk for amphetamine and hallucinogens, somewhat lower proportion for alcohol. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next part of the talk now. I'm gonna try and talk about this idea of vulnerability to psychosis. And, also, and that's quite early in the timeline. So these are people who are presenting, we wouldn't hopefully call someone drug related psychosis if they've already got a diagnosis of psychosis. So that's early in the timeline, the first presentations of psychosis related to substance use. That's the vulnerability we've talked about. There's also the other end of the timeline spectrum where we have the phenomenon of psychotic illness, established psychotic illness, which is exacerbated by substance use. I'm gonna talk about these two key concepts now. I've talked already about vulnerability to psychosis. In caring for people with psychosis in general, some people have more risk factors for the development of psychosis than others. Uh, we see at early stages, whether there's substance use or not, some people who present with um, brief, limited psychotic symptoms 
or with symptoms that are attenuated in frequency, only happen once a month, or attenuated in severity. So they believe the neighbours may be spying on them, but they can dismiss that thought. This is a vulnerability to psychosis. Symptoms typically occur in response to a stressor, and that's the stress diathesis model of psychosis. You know that you've got this pre-existing vulnerability, you get a second hit with a stressor, and that's what gives you the risk for the psychosis onset. Now, substance use is one such stressor. There's no doubt about that. But there are other stressors too, and our job as clinicians is to examine whether there are other stressors and whether there are other risk factors in a given person's vulnerability. Because substance use may be unmasking or triggering psychotic illness, which was going to happen anyway, just as other stressors could trigger or unmask psychotic illness. So let's talk about Jaden when we're assessing psychotic risk in substance use. So Jaden is known to use methamphetamine and he presents to ED with distressing paranoia and auditory hallucinations. Does Jaden have drug-induced psychosis? People might want to put their answers in the chat. Um, yes, no, not sure yet. Can you send him home from ED? This is the type of scenario I'll often get called about when I'll call overnight. This is something that we deal with and need all our ED clinicians are dealing with frequently. Um, and we're often seeing it in, in the community clinics also. My view is that in that um, brief uh, amount of information that we have with Jaden, we do not yet know. We have, there's no way we have enough information to know if he has drug-induced psychosis or not. We need to know a lot more information before we can give him that diagnosis. So what should we be asking? So this comes back to the start of the title, what to ask. What is the nature of the psychotic symptoms that Jaden's experiencing? For many mental health clinicians, this will be our bread and butter. But for drug and alcohol clinicians who may be joining or who may see people presenting with psychotic symptoms in the context of regular substance use, these are the type of things to be asking about. We also need to importantly understand whether the psychotic symptoms are occurring as an acute effect of substance use. And these will be particularly the psychotogenic substances, cannabis, psychostimulants and hallucinogens. And I've talked already about how uh, often transient symptoms can be dismissed as a sort of benign effect of use. But how do we know if they're transient unless we're asking? We also need to understand, is this a chronic effect of psychotic symptoms? We need to know, are the psychotic symptoms persisting beyond the period of use or intoxication? That makes it much less likely that these are purely drug related effects. We also need to ask about emergence of psychotic symptoms in periods between use, because evidence of that is starting to point away from this being purely related to substance use. We also need to ask about persistence of symptoms, whether the symptoms are increasing, it's also important to be aware that chronic substance use may exhibit kindling-like effects, such as we see in epilepsy, where someone who returns to use maybe years ago, never previously got psychotic symptoms. Now, when they return to use, they're more and more likely to get them following periods of abstinence. I think when, when I talk with colleagues, uh, about drug-related psychosis. There's an idea that it's really only drug-related psychosis where people will have symptoms and then not have symptoms. But actually my experience of working with people with um, early, early years of psychosis for many years is that whether there's substance use or not, psychosis is very, very heterogeneous. Some people, yes, have continuous illness, symptoms every day following onset. Other people have an episodic course of illness uh, symptoms will come and go in intensity. So that alone is not evidence that this is drug related. 
we need to ask about the timeline of experience of symptoms of psychotic symptoms and understand the relationship, the timeline of substance use. The best way is to ask about it. You need to ask about past similar experience of psychotic symptoms. This is the first time Jaden's come to ED, perhaps we don't know yet, but even if it is, he may have been having these episodes for some time. We need to understand whether the psychotic symptoms are occurring in the context of substance use and whether there's associated functional and social impairment and other risk factors for psychosis. That's really key and I've listed them here. I won't go into them in detail, but we need to be asking everybody about these. If Jaden has four family members with schizophrenia, suddenly it's looking less like drug related psychosis. This could actually be his first presentation of enduring psychotic illness. So let's come back to Jaden. We've asked for some more information. He does have some risk factors for psychosis. He has a number of um, childhood adversity, traumatic experiences, and there is a family history uh, in his paternal uncle, schizophrenia. We asked more about the nature and extent of the symptoms. So he's had these psychotic symptoms for three weeks since his last use of methamphetamine. Prior to that, um, he'd only been an occasional methamphetamine user, but he has increased his use to weekly about three months ago. He's had psychotic symptoms before, but never for over 24 hours. So now in my view, Jaden uh, should be deemed much higher risk for the development of schizophrenia. And I would be calling him a likely first episode psychosis related to substance use perhaps. Substance use is certainly part of the picture, but I wouldn't call it drug induced because Jaden might go away with the idea that if he just stops using methamphetamine, he'll never get psychotic again. And we've got no evidence to suggest that's correct. In fact, it could be misleading for him. So this is just a summary slide about common issues to look out for, asking about the psychotic symptoms, asking about a relationship with substance use, and recognizing that it's not always clear cut. People who use cannabis every day sometimes have psychotic symptoms, sometimes don't. That is a really difficult thing to unpack. And maybe we just have to monitor and watch and wait over time. But it's also really important, as always, to seek collateral from family and friends. OK. So just to finish up on this idea of what's the value of the term drug related psychosis? Well, again, I just want to make the point that comorbid substance use is very common in people with severe mental illness, just because it's um, just because substance use is present doesn't mean it's causal. OK, so I'm just going to flick through to this slide. We're now talking here about someone at the other end of the spectrum to Jaden. This is John. John is uh, 47. John has schizophrenia. He becomes acutely psychotic. He comes to see his case manager and he's known to regularly use cannabis. Does John have drug related psychosis? So you might want to write your answers in the chat. And I'll just let you think about it a little bit and then I'll go back to the previous slide because I've got them in the wrong order. So John does not have drug induced psychosis. John is having an exacerbation of his psychotic illness, which is schizophrenia. It may be related to drug use. It may not. We don't know yet. We've got to ask him some more questions. Why does John not have drug related psychosis? Well, let's go back to the definition. Symptoms are not better accounted for by a psychotic disorder that is not substance induced. John has schizophrenia. So John's having an exacerbation of psychotic illness. Is it related to drug use? We know that he uses cannabis. Look, it may be related to substance use if John's increased his use, if he's changed his supplier, if he's used um, a different form of cannabis or used it in combination with other drugs or used synthetic cannabis, which actually acts more like a stimulant. 
All those things might suggest that it's related to substance use. And that's important clinical information for us to know because we can then address that with John and say, John, you've changed your cannabis. It looks like this form was a bit more potent. You should go back to using the form that you previously were using. Meantime, we need to try and help you with your psychotic symptoms. But in actual fact, John's exacerbation of psychosis may not have anything to do with his substance use, because we know that people who have psychosis, who don't use substances, have exacerbations of psychosis for all sorts of reasons. He may have had a life event or a trigger. He may have stopped his treatment. John might be using cannabis in just the same way he has done for the past 20 years. And in that case, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's unhelpful, I think, to suggest to John that it was his cannabis on this occasion. We need to understand that he's got ongoing cannabis use and not jump to the conclusion that in this case, the cannabis caused this exacerbation. It's also true that sometimes people just have an acute exacerbation of psychosis with no obvious trigger. And we see that often in clinical services. Okay. So John's an example of someone of about the 30% of people with severe mental illness who have uh, psychotic illness and comorbid substance use. I've got some slides here I'm going to skim through quite quickly, um, which detail why comorbid psychosis and substance use is so common. It may, may be, and indeed it is the case, that people who develop psychosis have shared genetic or environmental risk factors that predispose them to be more likely to develop a psychotic illness, but also make it more likely that they would have sort of developed a substance use habit. So they've got that sort of common uh, shared factors for the two conditions. There's also a causal link between some substances and the development of new psychotic disorders. And indeed, um, some drugs have been used, like what, uh, those hallucinogens and others have been used in biological models of psychosis. A third explanation is that people who have voices or uh, are very socially excluded may use substances to help manage their distress, that's self-medication. Also high rates of ongoing use um, in our population with limited tailored uh, management options to help them stop their substance use means that for, for many people these are um, ongoing. And I'm just going to flick through these slides but I've included them so that you can go um, and have a look at them in due course and they really just go through in more detail those four reasons why comorbid substance use and psychosis is so common uh, and probably all four are true. It doesn't need to be one or the other. But I did just want to draw your attention to the evidence that we now have that uh, psychosis is linked to substance use temporally, yes, as we've talked about with the vulnerability to psychosis, substance use triggers that. But And that's where substance use precedes the onset of psychosis. The reverse is also true. We know this now, and this large, um, again, Scandinavian administrative data set allowed us to understand that there's also now very good evidence that people who develop severe mental illness are at much higher risk than the general population of developing a substance misuse disorder in the 10, 15 years after their psychotic illness, even when they had no substance use when they first presented. So they're actually about 3.7, three to four times more likely than the general population to develop a substance misuse habit following the onset of their psychotic illness in that sort of, uh, you know, up, up to 15 year window after the psychosis. And this is important because we need to be asking the people we're looking after about their substance use. It can change over time. Just because John or someone else, Jane, developed like schizophrenia at age 35 and didn't use alcohol then, doesn't mean that 10 years later we shouldn't be asking her about her alcohol use. We should be asking everybody. Um, so that's just taking us through all those reasons and just that final reason that once people have these habits 
quitting is really difficult. It's particularly difficult in our population of people because of cognitive deficits that they may have, lack of employment, occupation to, to give them a, something else to do, poor social supports and poor coping strategies. So we really need to work better at supporting them when we identify that they have comorbid substance use. So knowing now that it is a risk even after people have developed um, psychosis, how do we ask about substance use in the people that we look after? So we need to probably just screen every now and again, ask them are they using alcohol, ask them are they using tobacco, these are the most common of course, but ask them are they using all these other substances. I know that a lot of mental health clinicians don't feel particularly confident asking about drug use. They feel like they don't know what to ask, but it's not rocket science. We need to just ask, what drug do you use? How often do you use it? Are you using more than you used to? Does it affect your psychotic symptoms? Do you notice that in the days after you've been drinking that your, your voices are nastier or more intense or more distressing? We also need to ask about polysubstance use because that's very common. These are the criteria for assessing for misuse and dependence when we've got the, those sort of more problematic forms of use. And we need to also be asking about harms associated with use, which are listed here. Common issues to look out for are that people with comorbid substance use and psychosis have poorer outcomes and are more likely to have other mental health issues like depression, anxiety and suicidal behaviours. And they may be using other substances like benzos or painkillers and smoking again so common. So in conclusion regarding drug related psychosis, when you see an individual who has psychotic symptoms while using substances, Consider, first of all, like in the case of Jaden, early in the piece, may they be vulnerable to the development of a psychotic illness or more like John at the other end, whether they now have psychosis and this is an exacerbation uh, related to substance use. And these factors that I've listed here, I've talked about today, um, and these are important uh, factors to take into account when you're thinking about that question. Just a few final slides about outcomes. Why is this question important? Well, because people who have comorbid substance use and psychosis actually have much worse outcomes. So this is work that was conducted by Grant Sarah on people who were in the age bracket 15 to 29 in New South Wales over a period of several years being admitted uh, for psychosis, first episode psychosis, and whether substance use was present. It was present in about 50%, and that was predominantly cannabis um, in 30%, and stimulants, that's meth and amphetamine in 15%. Grant and his team followed up outcomes for these people for two years. They found that the people who had not used any substances at the time of their first episode did in between. The people who had used substances uh, and kept going, their outcomes were worse, or the people who had been using substances and stopped. Those people's outcomes were better than the people who hadn't had any substances at first episode. And that reflects likely that the people in blue with no drug misuse had other significant risk factors, more so than the other groups. They had family history, they had other things going on that uh, led to their psychosis, contributed to their psychosis vulnerability. So we know that people who don't use substances after a first episode tend to have fewer relapses, while those who continue to use have more relapses uh, than people um, who had no substance use. This doesn't mean that we can say to people, stop using drugs and you won't have any more psychotic episodes. We don't know that. One individual's vulnerability, we can't tell. We have to um, 
walk with them over the next few years to see what their trajectory is going to be like. But we can tell them that people who stop using drugs are less likely to relapse than people who keep using drugs. These are some other harms associated with comorbidity. And it's also important to recognise that people with comorbid substance use are less likely to seek, seek help, less likely to engage in care, less likely to take the treatment. They are a difficult to treat group. I've worked with many people in this situation and it is difficult but it is worth pushing through because they do need our support. Okay, the final slides, and I really want to leave some time for uh, Q&A, so I'm just going to whiz through these, but these again are the questions about what do we do once we have someone with uh, comorbid substance use and psychosis. It's really about providing care relevant to them, be holistic, look at both issues, understand the time frame, get carers involved, look at options. If they're mental health services, see if you can get drug and alcohol involved and vice versa. Immediately assess their risks to self and others, find out about their supports, try and be non-judgmental in your approach. Short term treatment of both conditions concurrently is the gold standard. It's not enough to say, well, I'm mental health, so I'll treat your psychosis, but the drug and the, the, the substance use, that's just not my that's just not my back. You, they need help with both. Long term, expect that people will relapse. Deal with the physical and mental health harms opportunistically when they come, give them help. If they don't come, you know, that's that's part of their pattern. And the evidence for it long term, so you know, for uh, the most effective treatments for helping people with substance misuse and dependence are CBT and residential rehab, also group counselling and contingency management. So it's probably too much to try and go into all that in detail today, but um, really what we're trying to do is be coordinated in our approach to care. To care. It's very rare that one individual would be able to treat both, but to work with colleagues in the other service. Um, because we know that when people receive a coordinated approach to care, their outcomes are better, they present to ED less, they have fewer relapses, fewer hospitalizations. All right, and just a brief plug for this book, which I authored together with colleagues at NDARC. This really, if you want to learn more about illicit drugs and how it affects mental health and other forms of help, this is a good guide. Um, uh, and a good good resource. Okay, and I'll leave it there. Uh, I'll leave this slide up, Matthew, because this introduces next week's talk. But may, we may now just want to take some Q and A. Or Julie, perhaps what I might do is I might stop screen sharing, and we can introduce this next talk um, just in the last minute or two. So over to you, Matthew. You're just on mute, Matthew. I'm just, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> so, look, I have one comment and then one question. So, the comment is really about etiological diagnosis in DSM, in the DSM system. There, there are some exceptions to this, but the two, DSM is mostly free of etiology, it's syndromal. Um, but in two instances, drug induced psychosis and post traumatic stress disorder, a putative cause is kind of essential to the diagnosis. And I think in both of those conditions, we often get it wrong. I think patients with post-traumatic stress disorder have often got a whole lot of other things going wrong with them and in addition to their trauma. And um, certainly with respect to drug-induced psychosis, you've illustrated that that's the case there. And during the course, I was wondering why we don't refer to you know, migration-induced psychosis or trauma-induced psychosis or, um, you know, family history-induced psychosis. We, we know that psychotic disorders are more or less half genetic and more or less half environmental. And the three main um, environmental causes are substances, in particular cannabis, uh, 
um, you know, childhood trauma and migration. And but we don't refer to any of those other causes. We no particular causes there as we focus on it. And um, I think, Matthew, that's why sometimes the term has come to be used quite loosely. And I think that's a really good uh, point to sort of draw attention to why we should we should just be thinking holistically about all the risk factors any individual has rather than assigning it just to drugs. And actually someone in one of the comments is talking about um, uh, you know psych psychosocial stresses and psychosis, which un undoubtedly there is an association between psychosocial stress and psychosis. I mean, in our own catchment area here, which ex extends from um, uh, you know the Vaucluse to the airport with its very steep socioeconomic gradient, the majority of our patient patients actually come from um, less um, privileged socioeconomic um, you know groups. Um, and there are obviously a, a range of reasons for that, but in my view, it's highly likely to be causal. Um, the question I had was, I mean, as a clinician who mostly works in an emergency department and mostly sees things when they've gone terribly wrong, my impression is, is that stimulant prescribing in the community is um, increasingly prevalent and sometimes totally disastrous. And, um, you know, I come from this as, uh, to this as someone who, you know, has had a, a, some interest in attentional processes in mental illness. And I'm horrified to now see that um, if you have attentional deficits in bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, alcoholism, PTSD, or whatever, this now warrants a separate diagnosis of ADHD and stimulant medication. Do you know anything about the risk of psychosis associated with medically prescribed stimulants? Yes, Matthew, thanks for that question. That is an important question, I think, that a lot of clinicians uh, perhaps may not be aware that the stimulant group that I talked about today, which includes crystal methamphetamine and methamphetamine, uh, also includes amphetamine. And indeed, methamphetamine is metabolized to amphetamine, which is the active drug um, that we use um, in dexamphetamine that we give to people with ADHD. And indeed, there was a large uh, American study which was published several years ago by Lauren Moran and colleagues, which looked at the question, what is the risk for development of psychosis in young people who are being prescribed stimulants? First of all, amphetamines or alternatively methylphenidate. And they found that the risk was increased in both groups within eight weeks of treatment. So we don't even know what the long-term effects are. But there was a difference according to the drug type used. So for methylphenidate, the risk was increased by the order of an odds ratio of about 1.6. So somewhat increased compared to not being on stimulant medication. But those on dexamphetamine had around a three, an odds ratio of three. So they were you know, significantly more likely to develop psychosis. And again, that could be what we talked about here, that use of the substance, which can give rise to psychosis, is triggering an, a psychotic episode in someone who was already vulnerable. The study couldn't look at that. I suspect it's likely that at least a proportion of those were people who were already vulnerable to psychosis. But it doesn't matter whether it's illicit or prescribed amphetamine, and the same holds for psychedelics, and I think we've got a problem coming, um, which is that these drugs can give rise to psychosis, and we need to be asking not just about illicit drugs, but also about prescribed drugs. Um, so popping my medico legal hat on, yes. I think what that means is that if you're about to prescribe Ritalin or dexamphetamine because of the obligation to inform people of um, all material risks to their satisfaction after the Rogers versus Whitaker case, you are obliged, I, I would think you would be obliged to inform the patient of that risk and your failure to do that 
may well make you liable for any harm associated with a psychosis that ensues. Your failure to warn of the risk of psychosis associated with stimulant risk. Um, yeah, thanks, Matthew. I think that's an important point for, for many prescribers who, who, who could be in the audience. Um, so someone here has said that, um, that Alana has said that, um, and I think it's probably our Alana who works in first episode, that, um, that anecdotally we have seen a number of first episode um, psychosis in young people with a recent ADHD and stimulant prescription. And on detailed history, it seems likely they were experiencing attentional changes um, consistent with a prodrome. And yes. following on from that comment, my view, my review of the literature would indicate to me that actually patients with a psychotic disorder have more severe attentional deficits than patients with ADHD as demonstrated by psychometric tests such as the continuous performance task and the Stroop task. Yes. And I thanks for that. And thanks for that point, Alana. And if it is Alana Scully, hi. Um, but you're absolutely right. And you know, it, it it is the case that ADHD is more common than psychosis. Obviously, in early psychosis services, we, with the benefit of hindsight, can say those attentional problems, depression, may have been actually the prodrome. It's it's likely that there are many people with attentional issues who are getting started on drugs and you know don't develop psychosis of course that's the case but it is as matthew says it's our duty as prescribers to ensure that we've done a really thorough check of uh, family history and potential psychosis vulnerability and that we're really closely and carefully monitoring for the emergence of psychotic symptoms in the context of sim um, stimulant prescribing and that we're 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 giving due diligence to stopping treatments if we see any emerging symptoms. Now, I am just conscious that we're running out of time, Matthew. Is there maybe one last question before we move to just um, provide some information to the audience about the, the next talk in the webinar series? Okay, look, there's a couple of, um, there's, there's a couple of good ones, actually. Um, uh, thoughts about the prescription of medical cannabis. Um, so that's an obviously looming one. And um, uh, another question, uh, uh, which uh, you know is, is something that has um, um, been my clinical experience in the last two years, particularly, is uh, about nitrous oxide induced psychosis, which is a fascinating and probably warrants a whole talk. Actually, <laughs> possibly so that could be one for next year. Yeah, we're seeing we're seeing a lot more uh, nitrous oxide canisters around, aren't we? Um, it's been the case that people have believed that nitrous oxide is very benign. You know, we've used it in dental surgeries and other places for, for many years. Uh, I think someone who's got a vulnerable brain, any psychoactive substance, it could trigger an episode. I believe there are some case reports, Matthew, of um, nitrous oxide related psychosis onset. Again, you know, we need to look at whether those people were already vulnerable. I suspect they may have been. There's not a clear biological mechanism for nitrous uh, giving rise to psychosis, but there's a lot we don't know about psychosis development. The other question about medicinal cannabis is a very important question. I think we need to wait for the evidence that there's any benefit, and we need to be certain that we're not doing any harm to people um, who participate in research studies there is uh, some early evidence that forms of cannabidiol, medicinal cannabis, that have higher proportion uh, cannabidiol compared to THC, which is believed to be the psychotogenic component. So forms with more cannabidiol, less THC may be better. There's very limited evidence to date that it's helpful for people with psychosis. Okay, and with that, I'm just going to ask Julie just to share the last slide, which um, provides information about the next webinar in our series. We really want this webinar series to be relevant to our audience, and thank you very much, everybody who's completed the poll. We will look to those topics as the um, themes for future webinars. But next up in our series, we have Dr. Pramudi Gunaratne, 
So uh, Pramudi Gunaratne is an expert in intellectual disability. This is something which is often underdetected um, in people uh, with complex psychosis. And uh, Pramudi is going to talk to us about how to uh, assess and manage intellectual disability. Um, now, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that we are taking a break for Easter. So the next webinar will be on the 10th of May. Thanks very much, everybody, for your attendance today. And thanks to, very much to Prof Matthew Large for chairing the discussion. Thank you very much.